Hello, I'm Mari Kirk, Director of Engagement and Impact at the USSC. Thank you for joining us on the USSC Briefing Room today. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're recording on today. The University of Sydney is located on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and future. This is our second episode in the series recorded following our Indo-Pacific Strategy Simulation in November 2023. In this episode, you'll hear from Professor Peter Dean, who's the Director of Foreign Policy and Defense here at the United States Study Center, uh, and he's in conversation with Zach Cooper, a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C. Okay, over to the strategy simulation team. So welcome, Zach Cooper. I'm sure a long-term listener, but first-time caller here on the USSC podcast. That's right. As a bit of a, a background for our listeners, Zach, although you have uh, multiple podcasts you've been on or been involved in and uh, media personality and uh, star extraordinaire of the strategic studies world, um, for those listeners who may not be uh, familiar with you, you and your background, can you give us a bit of a, just a rundown of, you know, where you come from, what you're doing now, how you kind of, I suppose, got into um, the game of working in policy, working in, on Asia policy in, in particular? Boy, it's such a terrible path that I've gone to end up, uh, you know, working in think tanks for the last 15 years. Uh, but uh, so I'm uh, a senior fellow now at the American Enterprise Institute. I've been there about five years. I spent previous five years at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where Pete and I got a chance to write write together a couple of times uh, and where I was working for, for Mike Green, which you're suffering under his, his terrible reign right under now. The, under so, the reign yeah, of yes. Dr. Green. Yeah. Um, and uh, spent a little time in a f- couple of other think tanks, the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments and the German Marshall Fund. Um, and before that, spent a few years in government, uh, two in the Pentagon, and then one detailed from the Pentagon to the White House. And somewhere in the middle of that, I uh, did a PhD on, on things that no one really pays attention to anymore, uh, related to how uh, militaries change during power shifts. So that is my very strange pathway down here to Australia. Well, well, for those of us who do have PhDs, it's one of those things where you think it's the most important thing in the world while you're doing it. You finish it, you get a nice piece of paper, and you get to join the club. And then it, you know, often write a book about it, but then you kind of realize a few years later that either you're the only one who's read the book or you and a handful of others. And often in the realm, particularly of political science and international relations, whatever you've written on the world has moved on despite the important work that you've done, even though the world should evolve around your PhD thesis. Yeah, that's right. I, I, in fact, this morning I got the final book contract for my book that's coming out of the dissertation only seven years after I finished it and 15 years after I first started to think of the idea and the world has very much moved on from where it was at the beginning. Well, like most things, I think probably, Zach, if we hold on long enough, maybe the, the worm will turn <laughs> right. and will come back. Yeah. Yeah, uh, right. We had, uh, in the last couple of days, we've been spending uh, time with another good friend of ours, Brennan Taylor, and I, I managed to make the very good crack yesterday during one particular discussion, if only someone who we were standing with had done a PhD on sanctions as grand strategy, <laughs> gee, that'd be useful right now. <laughs> and Brendan having me standing right next to us and it's sort of all, all back in vogue, sanctions again, um, right. particularly after what's happened in Ukraine and the response that uh, has been happening to Russia. Before we get on to the more substantive points of view, you, you've given us your um, broad background about your education um, about your involvement in work. And I suppose what's different often for our Australian listeners is we have a, a different um, policy system here in Australia. So more often than not, you get sort of people who work in academia and think tanks and then people who work in government. We don't have that US system where you move between the think tank world and the, and the government world. Um, it, it does happen sometimes. Uh, I think of people like Hugh White and Paul Dibb who've done that from very mm-hmm. senior roles in defence. Brendan, the late, great Brendan Sargent, who um, did that. But I suppose from, I just want to grasp from your perspective, um, how important was your time in the Pentagon and in the White House to the way it sort of structures your thinking um, now? Is that still something formatively you draw from? Um, or is it that you know, your engagement, um, and I know in think tank world, most of us are very lucky we have deep engagement with people in policy roles. Is it more that, you know, that was a, a great foundational piece for you and now you more rely on the connections you have into contemporary policy circles? How, how's that, I suppose, 
what I'm asking is how does that kind of practical experience of policymaking influence the way you do your work, the way you craft your ideas? Yeah, you know, it's a really interesting question because I always think that, uh, you know, think tanks have many roles, but one of them is to try and uh, help academics and policymakers talk to each other. Um, so a lot of people in American think tanks, you know, they have an academic background perhaps, but they've spent a little bit of time in the policy world and they're not a perfect fit in either one. And so they sort of land as I have in the think tank space because uh, we're, you know, we don't want to be tenured faculty members perhaps, but but we also don't want to be you know, full-time career government folks. And so we want to have a little bit more flexibility to bounce in and out. Um, I think time in government in the U.S. system is absolutely critical. And I think this is probably true in any system. But, you know, the American system is just so huge. And if you want to do anything, you have to understand the details of how the system works. You know, what is going to get raised at a National Security Council meeting and how heavily are different departments likely to weigh in? Um, how's the president actually make these decisions at the end of the day? You know, what are the interactions like with the Congress? I, I just don't think you can really understand those things if you haven't spent some time in government. Um, so for me, I, I feel like I use that experience all the time. Um, but, you know, I also use the academic experience all the time, right? I, I think a lot of what we do in the think tank space is trying to be a little bit more theoretical than the policymakers can be because they're too busy doing day to day work. Um, so for me, I, I find both the policy experience and the academic experience are, are critical to what I do, at least in the think tank space, um, but in very, very different ways. Yeah, look, they're fantastic observations and reflections. I'd say one of the things I was talking to about a, a friend of mine policy the other day is one of the things about working in government is understanding what the art of the possible is, given all the constraints you have to work in, whether it's a uh, a legal constraint by the ways that the, the the laws of the country particularly operate or a policy constraint or, or the way your minister or secretary likes to operate and their focus or the way the system actually comes to making decisions and, and having some understanding of that. And I'll just give you one quick example of this, right, which is um, on AUKUS. I think a lot of Australians are a bit frustrated with the United States at the, the pace of legislation on AUKUS, right? And I think actually the, the frustration is understandable because AUKUS is a presidential level announcement and it's a multi-decade long commitment by all three countries to each other. And so you'd think, well, we should be able to get some basic legislation through on this. And it's a lot harder than people think. And, and you know, the reason is because at the end of the day, this comes down to committee chairmen and, you know, some longstanding frustrations that they've had between the executive branch and the legislative branch over things like, you know, spending on, on the Navy and shipbuilding. And if you don't have a pretty deep understanding of, of the debate on the Hill and how that interacts with the Congress, it's actually really hard to do your job as a think tanker well, because so much of the time you're trying to explain either to your government or to foreign governments what the art of the possible is, as you said. And so for me, I, I've just found that government time absolutely critical. And I think that's a really important point, whether it's looking at August legislation in the United States through Congress or whether it's looking at the way that Australia is engaging with AUKUS on a political debate, understanding the domestic politics, I think, are really important. And certainly, you know, on the, on the Australian side of, of the Pacific Ocean debate around this and someone who studies and looks at Congress um, in great detail, I, I'm actually unsurprised where the position of AUKUS sits at the moment right. and how an issue of such grand strategic importance, so to speak, and at that, as you said, the presidential level, is now being wound up with submarine industrial base and US Navy shipbuilding. And I keep saying to people, I'm surprised if, I would be absolutely flabbergasted if that didn't happen. Right. The same way that AUKUS has become a point of debate within the Labor Party, the government over here, over both it's the issue of the relationship with the United States of America, but base level, who's going to build submarines where, who's going to build what componentry where, um, how many jobs go to the great state of Western Australia, how many jobs go to the great state of South Australia, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, what is the union movement's commitment and fidelity around this, particularly, you know, the, their politics is very different to the national level and strategic politics. And, you know, the cancellation of the French attack class submarine, why 
it may make for many of us complete sense from a strategic point of view to replace that with a nuclear powered submarine. The domestic politics of that for a shipbuilder in Adelaide are very different. So I think that's also another key part of understanding that, that nuance of the art of the possible. Um, that relates to sort of all of this relates obviously back to the Indo-Pacific, to Asia, to the strategic realm that we both focus on um, in particular. So I wanted to, to really ask you, you know, we all know that there are a set of regional sort of primary regional flush points that animate policy discussions both here but in the United States. So can I ask you to reflect on at the moment, and they do change and move depending on the, on, on the time and the situation and the politics of the time, what's really from those regional security flashpoints in, in Asia, what, what are the ones that are really animating the, com- the policy conversation, the political conversation bashing Washington at the moment? As you know, as well as anyone, Pete, uh, I think everyone is focused on the Taiwan scenario, uh, or one of the many Taiwan scenarios that could happen. Um, you know, our friend Brendan Taylor wrote a great book on the four flashpoints. And, and I think five, 10 years ago, people really did think a lot about East China Sea and North Korea and South China Sea, and, and maybe more recently on you know, the Sino-Indian border. But in Washington now, the thing that everyone is focused on is Taiwan. Um, and of course, you know, at the moment, right, there's this standoff between China and the Philippines over Second Thomas Shoal, and I, I think uh, Americans are nervous about that. But the type of conflict that we really worry about, the one that would escalate into a major war, I think most Americans assess that the, the only place that's likely to happen uh, or more likely to happen would be across the Taiwan Strait. So that's the flashpoint that I, I tend to think a lot about. And, and the, the one thing I'd say about this is, too much of the debate, in my view, has focused on a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. I think the real challenge is more likely to be below that level of an invasion. Things like a blockade, like seizure of outlying islands, cyber attacks or missile attacks on Taiwan. These, I think, are the much more attractive options in some ways for the Chinese, not because they give China control over Taiwan, but if Xi Jinping is trying to punish a wayward, you know, leadership from his perspective, uh, a wayward leadership team in Taipei, I don't think an invasion is the way to do it. Um, If he wants to teach the United States a lesson, I don't think an invasion is the way to do it. So I worry a lot about those other scenarios. And I, I fear that we're focusing a bit too much on what is in many ways the easiest military scenario for us to respond to, which is an invasion, and not thinking enough about these other types of uh, contingencies. Yeah, well, that all, it's a fantastic point. I, I thoroughly agree with you. It always makes me think of um, our colleague, Tom Wright, who's now in the NSC, yeah. and he stole this great book title, in, which is All Measures Short of War. And I think that approach of how do you deal with scenarios and flashpoints in All Measures Short of War because I, I totally agree with you in, in many respects, the actual conflict component is not a certainly easier problem to solve, but it's a more direct problem to get at. Um, and it doesn't involve as much complexity in some regards as some other scenarios I think that we can um, come across. And one of the things I always reflect on, and it'd be interesting to get your thoughts and observations here, is I think we underestimate the risk profile to Xi Jinping and the Communist Party in China of the invasion scenario. That if we think about, well, if Xi Jinping gets up tomorrow morning and decides it's it's worth the risk, what is he actually risking? Because if it doesn't come off, the repercussions for that for China, the Chinese Communist Party and Xi's leadership is just so enormous. But pursuing measures that are less than invasion don't hold that same level of political and military risk. Um, so do you think this is also a part of that calculation? Do you think it's, and I suppose extending on that, do you think that the Chinese are making the calculation at the moment that they may not be successful? Is one of the reasons deterrence is holding is because um, the Chinese don't think they could successfully prosecute an invasion at this point in time? I hope that's... The calculus, I, you know, like many people, uh, I, I'm 
I have very low confidence in my ability to understand what's going through the head of Xi Jinping. And I, I'm not sure that there are many other people in China that really matter other than Xi. So um, what's going through his head, as, as you know, we've all watched with Vladimir Putin, is, is what matters. And uh, he may make assessments that are very different than ours. He may make mistakes. Um, but, but my assessment is very similar to yours, that at the end of the day, this is a very risky endeavor for a guy that actually has shown to be fairly risk averse in a lot of his leadership. Um, if they try an invasion and it doesn't succeed, that is existential, not just for Xi Jinping, but maybe even the Communist Party. And I think especially with a slowing economy, the, the risk of mounting that sort of operation and having it fail would be tremendous. So that's not to say that she wouldn't try it. And I think if we push him and the communist leadership into a corner, they, they may do things that surprise us. But I would hope that the focus on our end will be on trying to make sure that he doesn't feel like he's in a corner, but we still can you know, maintain peace and stability across the street um, without, without triggering a conflict of that sort. Um, now, of course, there's a lot of debate about whether the Chinese might have a timeline and, you know, could be 2027 or 2032 or 2049. I don't think we know. And my guess is the Chinese might not know themselves, but, but we do, what we do know is we've got to have the capabilities to be able to deter today, tomorrow and 2027 and, and decades from now. And so I think that's where, you know, the work that you've done through the DSR and that some in the U S are doing on our defense strategy is really critical to bulk up our capabilities quickly to make sure that deterrence does hold. So you're, you're an avid um, watcher or analyst of both Japan and Australia as part of U.S. strategy in the region and particularly all the work that you've done on U.S. allies and partners in Asia. Can I get you to reflect on to what extent do you think those priorities you've outlined in Washington are also shared in Tokyo and in Canberra? Do you see an alignment um, or do you see that there's a different focus based in the different sub-regions that each of these countries ex exist in? Or are there sort of any cracks or seams you think where we need to work a bit harder to understand each other's strategic interests and capabilities a bit better? It's, it's such an interesting question and, and it's moving so quickly. So I, I think the snapshot for me at the moment is, is one in which we've come so far over the last five or 10 years. I, I remember when you and I and Mike and Brendan wrote this report, uh, what, 10 years ago? Um, 10 years ago. On, on the alliance and, and we're sort of making the argument that we had to have much more close alignment in the way that Australia and America approached the region. Um, that was a pretty hard message for many people in Canberra to hear and, and it didn't go over well in, in some corners. And now I think it would be sort of second nature. And, and something similar has happened in Japan, although it's, it goes back a little longer, right? I, I think um, in, in the U.S.-Japan relationship, since maybe 2014, we've had pretty good alignment and um, increasingly over the last five years, even better alignment on cross-strait issues. But I do think there's some big differences still. Um, so I think if you ask most Americans in the national security space, uh, what would happen in a Taiwan contingency, you would get a lot of Americans saying, well, course, Japan and Australia, which are our you know, two closest allies along with Korea, they would be there full stop. And I have the sense that it, it depends a little bit on the type of scenario that we're in and, and how we got into those scenarios. Um, and the political debate in Washington moves really fast on Taiwan, maybe a little faster than folks in Canberra are uh, comfortable with. You know, the political debate has moved quite fast in Tokyo too. But the cooperation between uh, Tokyo and, and Washington on specific Taiwan scenarios is actually not as far uh, along as you might think. So bottom line is incredibly uh, incredible amounts of progress, I would say, in the last few years on how we see China, how we see the region more broadly. But there's still a little bit of daylight, I think, between the political leadership in each country. Yeah, look, I have to say for my own reflections, um, I'm a little frustrated with the, the nature of the Taiwan, for instance, debate here in the country. It seems at a 
at one level, every time we hear uh, or see our foreign minister, defence minister, prime minister questioned by the media on this, we get the inevitable Taiwan question that has no context, is very reductionist and one-dimensional. You know, would you support the United States in a war against Taiwan without an understanding or without any nuance there around, well, what type of scenario, what type of conflict? Is it an invasion? Is it a blockade? Is it a cyber attack? What's the catalyst for this? You know, what's who's been the protagonist here? Is this Taiwan declaring independence? Is is it the PRC taking universal? None of that nuance seems to be at all captured, or in some respects, I think in Australia wanting to be entered into. So I think there's a lot of work we have to do in Australia about understanding the actual regional context of Taiwan as well. I think. Too often in Australia, in the, the commentary and the media, it's a reductionist, like, oh, this is a thing that the United States might drag us into a war or we'll go into a war with the United States and go, well, hang on, Taiwan has a say about this, China has a say about this, but so does South Korea, so does Japan, so does the Philippines, so does most of ASEAN. It's a regional issue and we in Australia, I think, just don't put it enough into that regional context. Mm-hmm. To extrapolate this little part just a little bit further, I was up in Japan um, earlier this year with um, with Mike um, uh, and having deep engagements on a project that we're doing. And you know, I, I have to say, I was really struck and surprised post the Japanese NSS and NDS, the National Security Strategy and Defence Strategy, how forward leaning the Japanese are, basically in relation to their engagement with Australia, but also broader regional security issues. And I know you've literally just come, you're in Australia at <laughs> yeah, the moment, um, yeah. but pretty much via Japan. Um, what was your take last week of being in Japan and, and where they're kind of viewing their security situation and their engagement with the United States and Australia and other regional issues? You know, the US-Japan alliance, I think if you ask any expert on it, they would say, the U.S.-Japan alliance is in a better spot than it's been maybe ever, certainly in decades. Um, and I think probably the same is true about U.S.-Australia alliance, right? Um, hard to think of a time when we were more aligned and, and doing more things together. And yet I, I do think there are some gaps. Um, the, the one I worry about the most in the Japan context is uh, if we had a cross-strait conflict, the coordination between the U.S. and Japan on the military side is really critical. And uh, as you know well, Japan is now building what is called its permanent joint uh, headquarters, which is actually sort of modeled after Australia's own operational command structure in some ways. Um, But we don't really understand exactly how that's going to interface on the U.S. side with the Indo-Pacific Command and all the other command structures that we have in Japan alone, right? Um, 3MEF, the Marines in Okinawa. We've got the 7th Fleet in Yokosuka. We've got the 5th Air Force at Yokota. We've got the U.S. Army uh, in various places around the Pacific. So so this is really complicated. And I, I think there's a lot of work left for the U.S. and Japan to do on this issue. And if we were in a Taiwan Strait contingency, this would be absolutely a, a critical challenge and and not the kind of thing you want to be figuring out on the fly. Definitely not the type of thing you want to be figuring out on the fly. And I think like C2 arrangements across all of our countries is is really important. And I think my reflection would be they have to be modernized. So we've modernized strategically. And I look now at at the US national defense strategy and security strategy, the Japanese equivalent and and the DSR in Australia, they're all focused on deterrence. They're all focused on deterrence by denial. They're all focused around critical capabilities that they need to develop in each of these countries. They're all focused on resilience measures, on defence industrial development. So there's a huge amount of strategic coordination. But then when you scratch the surface below that and you get down to, oh, how are we coordinating (laughs) command and control for a regional contingency around one of these flashpoints? And it doesn't have to be just Taiwan. What happens if something in the South Pacific happens or the South China Sea, Korean Peninsula, as we're we're in much more of an organised almost, you know, collective security response, strategically coordinated mechanism, it becomes really important then how you get down to the, those operational areas and, and draw that together. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and, you know, for the United States, the place that we do this, this kind of combined work best is, is in the NATO context. It's not actually in Asia, right? In the NATO context, 
you've got allied command operations that does the operational coordination. And then you've got allied command transformation that does uh, the capability development together with our allies. So you've got this operational part, you've got the capability development part, and they're very deeply institutionalized. If you come to Asia, uh, the only place that we have real operational combined command is in Korea. And that, that came out of the fifties. Right. Um, and we actually don't really have combined capability development outside of a handful of programs with anyone except for now increasingly Australia. So um, people often, we always talk about an Asian NATO. I, I'm of the view that that's never going never to happen, happen. <laughs> but, but the aspects of NATO that are critical are the, you know, this, this underlying infrastructure. And we're still lacking that even in the very strong bilateral alliances we have. So I, I think we've got a lot of work to do both with Australia and Japan on, on both of those issues. So flashpoints are, are really interesting. Um, one of the things that we often do in think tank land is try to run simulations around these various flashpoints and to try and get a better understanding of how they work. And, and you've been with us for the last day and a half on a strategic simulation that we've been running here at USSC. So I just wanted to get you to reflect on your experience on running simulations. I'm sure you, I know, I know you've done tons of them in your think tank world work. I'm sure at your time in the Pentagon or, and or the White House, you've probably done them there. Um, so can you just reflect on this? What, what do you think the sort of the, the, the benefits and the limitations are of running sort of strategic and crisis simulations? Yeah, my, my big takeaway is that simulations don't teach you the answers. They teach you the questions. And, you know, I, boy, I've probably done 50, 75 simulations on Asia crises. Um, and each one is very different, but I always come away with questions that I worry about coming out of those simulations. And they're always a little different. Um, you know, I, I think a few years ago, a lot of the questions that, I was worried about were the degree to which the United States even understood where countries in Asia were on China issues. Um, because as, as everyone in Australia knows, well, uh, Americans don't always listen, uh, that well. We, no. we, yes. I know this is shocking. Never been accused of that. Yes. Never heard of that. Yeah, myself. We, we, we like to talk and we don't always like to listen. And so sometimes we hear what we want to hear, even from our closest friends in the region. And so I, I don't think you're alone on that, Zach. <laughs> don't <laughs> fair, think the United fair. States has a monopoly yeah, on that. Yeah, but we're particularly good at it. Yeah. Um, and so a few years ago, I, the disconnect that I sensed in many of these simulations was more just a lack of political understanding of where countries were on China. Now, you know, maybe half of the region has really shifted their views on China in the last few years. And so what I've noticed in a lot of the more recent simulations is there is more and more agreement at the political level about what needs to done and how we have to be aligned on China policy. But then these harder questions about, well, what does that actually mean in terms of policies? How would you respond to a specific crisis? Um, do we have the same view on economic sanctions and their effectiveness or on China's objectives? Those things, I think there's still some pretty big gaps between the US and even its closest allies, to say nothing of you know other partners in the region and Southeast Asia and elsewhere who, who have very different in Washington. And you were just saying before just how many of these things that you've done. I know that you've done them in multiple countries. You run them yourself. You've done them plenty in the United States, um, in Australia multiple times and in other parts of the region. Is there any great difference, do you think, between the way different countries run these or is it more the sort of design of the simulation around what they're focused on, the functional thing that they're or the topical area that they're focused on that drives that? Or, or do you think countries have particular ways of doing these strategic simulations that sort of reflect their own, I suppose, national security cultures? You know, I think every country has a completely different culture when it comes to these. So I've done dozens in Japan and uh, Japan for extremely understandable reasons is very worried about the legal implications of very specific moves by China and what that would mean for Japan. So, you know, often in a Japan context, the questions you're asking are less political and often more legal questions um, about what Japan even could do in a certain scenario. Um, whereas, you know, for Americans, uh, legal constraints 
on, in terms of, you know, war powers are just not something we talk about much now, yep. you know, maybe many, uh, in Congress wish, wish that the legislative constraints were more substantial, but, but they're not that big. Um, so I do find some really big differences. The, the one other area that I would highlight is there's some strategic communities that are willing to be very blunt, right? I think this is one of the best parts of the U.S.-Australia relationship. Um, you can come to Australia and have some really direct, uncomfortable discussions. Friendly. Really? But we, we say what we mean? I know. Oh, shocking it's, revelation. Yes, amazing. Um, it will not shock you that that's not always true in the rest of the region. You know, in, yeah. in Southeast Asia, when you're doing these simulations, often, um, you know, Southeast Asian participants will, will be quiet when they disagree. And so the, the outcomes actually are very, very different in part just because of how people interact with one another. But I think you also see this in real life, right? Yes. That, that sometimes, you know, uh, Americans listen better to Australians than they do to Indonesians, for example, in part because we, the, you know, Australian strategic community can be so direct in a way that we just have to listen. And sometimes in Southeast Asia, I think if, if folks aren't really direct with us, we, we hear what we want to hear, not what they want us to hear. Subtleties sometimes and cultural backgrounds, uh, as we know, always matter. And personalities do, I'd say. Yeah. One of my reflections is, you know, you can run the same game and I'm sure you've probably done this the same simulation multiple times and you change the actors within that, even if you give them the same roles and people with similar levels of experience. And the dynamics of the people who are in the room change the, the direction that they sometimes go, even with the same um, problem sets. Um, what sort of, what do you think the real limitations are of doing this? What are you going to be conscious of when you're doing a simulation to not over sort of say, oh, well, we learned this lesson, so that has to apply in real life. Where, where is it do we need to put a box around it and say, well, it is only a simulation. It is only a, an, an, an example of how a group of countries or a group of actors may or may not respond. You sort of said it's really great for understanding questions you actually have to ask and reflecting on them in advance before crisis happens. What are we going to be careful of to not, to not jump to conclusions about? I think sometimes people do simulations and they think the outcomes are, are sort of the truth, right? Yep. And my experience having designed a lot of games is that most of the time I can design the outcome of the game that I would like. Um, and so the game designers are often, uh, not just architects, but they're directing players in a path that they want. And so I hope that what people take away from games is not that this is the answer to a problem, but um, that the, this tells them the kinds of questions they would be struggling with. You know, I'll give you one quick example, which is CSIS has done some wonderful games uh, since I left on the Taiwan scenario. And um, the game designers are very, very thoughtful. Uh, and Eric Higginbotham, Mark Kansian, and others, you know, what those show in my mind is that there's a really hard operational problem for China in a Taiwan Strait scenario, which is how do you avoid uh, your amphibious vessels getting sunk in the opening, you know, hours, days of a conflict? And it is a very hard operational problem. But just because uh, it wasn't solved in that game doesn't mean that the Chinese aren't going to try and come up with other possible answers. So, you know, I think it tells you, okay, we need to be asking some hard questions about our ability to sink Chinese amphibious vessels and in invasion, but it doesn't mean that the answer is that the Chinese can't invade. Um, and, and so I think that's a big takeaway that sometimes people get a little bit wrong. So um, before we just wrap up here, I'll, I'll leave you with one last question. I know you've done so many of these. In, in fact, you, you, you're probably tired and probably would at some stage love to have a nice long break from doing simulation <laughs> studies. But um, if you were giving a carte blanche by a funder, by government or something to go and design a sort of a game, a simulation to do something different or to focus on a different element of capability or strategy or, or a different you know, type of scenario, you got to pick whatever you wanted to do next that would be of interest to you. Um, where, what direction would you like to take? What's some, something new you would like to try out and try and simulate out to try and understand what lessons we, uh, questions we should be asking? The big one for me is the role of time. I, I think we don't understand enough about how 
dynamics really change tremendously over time. So, you know, you, you may think Indonesia is important now, but give it 20 or 30 years, it's completely different down the line, right? And in many ways, China's the opposite, right? You know, given Chinese growth rates, um, China's not going to be as important, most likely in 30 years as, as we may feel it is today. Um, and so I think the role of time is something that is really hard to think about when all of us think tank people are writing reports about what's going on today or tomorrow, but trying to simulate out decades and really understand those dynamics for me is, is extremely valuable and the kind of thing that you can only do in a simulation. You, you can't do it any other way. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Zach. That's been uh, wonderful. And thank you to all you listeners out there. Hopefully you've got uh, a greater insight into the world of simulation, but also to where we sit currently on different perspectives in Japan, Washington, and Canberra about the regional flashpoints and about our attempts to maintain deterrence and to keep peace and security in the Indo-Pacific. So thank you, Zach. Thanks, Pete. Always great to be with you. As we wrap up, I'd like to point out a couple of other podcasts that may be of interest. Our CEO, Dr. Michael Green, is co-host of the Asia Test Board podcast with Jude Blanchett, the Freeman Chair for China Studies at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'd also recommend checking out our USSC Live podcast series that runs recordings from our major live events, including the panel discussions from the inaugural Sydney International Strategy Forum. You can find these on our website, ussc.edu.au, or wherever you